Uh, oh, this is the go. OGM call for Thursday, May 25, 2023. And we just missed some good humor. Um, and science. Exactly. Yeah. I, if, if I can just continue, somebody who has been to this call once or twice, and Jerry, you know her, you know her uh, it's uh, Jenny from Holland. Uh -huh. uh, she insists that you can't tell jokes uh, online in Zoom. So I what? guess we, we just had a great uh, example of how you can. We've disproved her theory <laughs> twice now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I because, referenced because Ken had the meteorological humor just a moment ago, which we also yeah. missed. Uh, Ken, yeah. do you want to repeat that for the record? <laughs> for the record, yeah, we say that San Francisco is cool because Sacramento sucks. <laughs> and now you have to explain it, I think, again. Okay. So no, don't because... explain it. That's really? the part you should okay. Say. I won't explain oh, it. You know, if okay. you got to explain a joke, it's not funny. That's what they say, yeah. right? Well, Good point. You know what? If you don't work for it. You won't value it. <laughs> so it is. Anyone who wants to know can DM me and I'll, I'll explain the meteorological <laughs> implications of why that's a true statement. Awesome. And I'll explain the science connection. Um, cool. Lovely to see everybody. Um, uh, Stacy, thanks for reminding me. And I think that the question was, um, oops, there we go. Um, how do you, can I reframe it? Yeah, go ahead. How do you measure success? How do you define success? And you can e answer either one. And I've forgotten, were we talking about for OGM or for you personally? Up to you. Speaker's choice. That sounds good. So, um, oh my God, sorry, breaking news. Supreme uh -oh. Court just voted against giving the Environmental Protection Agency the authority to police the water pollution in the Clean Air Act. So wow, yeah. <laughs> wow. Do you know why that might be a good thing? Maybe might. If sure. people are doing that locally, they'll be more invested and they'll make better decisions. That goes to decentralization. I'm um, just a thought. Uh, that's if they think it's a priority and if there's no mandate to do anything they'll it's well, uh, there's so, a better chance uh, if they live there it'll be a priority um i have a first thought about success please talk. success is when you get to move on to the next problem <laughs> and i and i haven't thought about the supreme court decision mm -hmm. it just gives permission for major polluters to keep on polluting. <laughs> exactly. They're both true. Um, oh. so, um, cool. Um, Ken, thanks for the news and posting the article to it. Wow. <laughs> kind of crazy. Uh, so let's go to the question at hand, which is how do you define success? And you're welcome to talk about success for OGM, success for yourself, uh, maybe success in general. And uh, now accepting volunteers to jump in. And maybe if we use the Zoom hands as the protocol for next person up, that would work great. Yeah. Um, and I think also don't feel like you can only participate once in this particular theme. Just jump in. If you want to define it a couple different times, jump on in. Um, and and Gil Gil is writing in the chat. Success depends on the domain of concern. Absolutely. So, riff on the differences if you wish. That would be great. Um, Eric, you wrote uh, success is making different mistakes each year. Do you want to expand on that just a little a wee bit? Yeah, my rabbi once told me that, <laughs> so it stuck in my mind. Um, that uh, like when we have the holidays for Judaism, you want to make different mistakes than the year before. <laughs> That's the goal. <laughs> and it's an interesting goal. Um, and uh, I just want to personally apologize for overstepping boundaries. Stacy, we'll discuss that offline. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Um, my old boss's uh, signature line uh, 
has been, I think still is forever, always make new mistakes. And that's Esther Dyson. <clears throat> but at the end of each of her emails, it says, always make new mistakes. And when she was editing my writings, it was really interesting because it totally great to make mistakes. But boy, the, like the next time that that uh, the same error showed up, it's like, no, no, no. Haven't you learned that thing? You should internalize that. So that, I guess that was a form of success. Stacey, go ahead. I would just want to add to what you and Eric just said. If you have to make mistake, make them new. And success would be if they're different. Um, Scott. And also, as okay. we come in and take turns into the conversation, feel free to pause for a moment uh, as we jump in. That way we can blend in some of our check-in protocol as well. But floor is yours, Scott. Um, this is a great prompt. So I initially started thinking about it in terms of clearly defined problems. And OK, I have a project, and the project's completed. Sort of like what Doug said, you know, you move on to the next problem. Um, <clears throat> but a lot of the things we talk about in this forum are things that are unclear. We're kind of feeling our way through it and, and figuring out. And we may not have a success metric or the success might be different or changing as we go through it. And so I thought, what am I going to say here? And it real I realized something. I had something happen yesterday that I'll, I'll explain in a minute. Um, so you know the old quote about happiness? If you chase happiness, you're not gonna get it, but if you busy yourself with something else, it'll come and land on your shoulder. You know, It's along those lines, it's sort of related to the idea of flow and that happiness is not something to be pursued. Happiness is something that happens while you're doing other things. And I thought, you know, for me, maybe success is that same thing. If I'm chasing it, then I'm not gonna get it and I'm not gonna notice it until it lands and I think, oh, that worked, that, that worked. And that relates to the theme that I'm seeing through a lot of the chat, which is trying new things, experimenting, uh, making small, low risk experiments and doing a lot of them um, because then you you will, if you're paying attention, you'll stumble on success or little successes while you're experimenting. And so I, I don't know that that's kind of where my my head is at with that is that success and happiness are two things that you shouldn't be pursuing directly, but they are going to happen as a result of your faithful pursuit of things that you think are true and then your reevaluation of those as you get feedback from reality so um i love that scott and i i think it was hank i heard talking about uh and things should end soon not pursue does that ring a bell from our conversations hank who am i thinking about then no i can't place that can you say something more about it um, well, it's very much in line with what Scott was just saying, is that, is yeah. that um, many things uh, are the result of uh, of an action, but but they break if you try to pursue them directly. Uh, Brian Eno has a whole deck of cards called Oblique Strategies, where he was trying to say, hey, indirect approaches often work for things. I talk about this with trust, for example. If, if you hear someone say, trust me. Like if your BS radar doesn't start glowing bright red at that moment, like you're probably not awake. But if they then do things that are trustworthy over time, you get you earn trust. Uh, same thing often for love and happiness and, and all those kinds of things. They're, they, they're not things that you can call into being by approaching them directly often. Something like that. Um, yeah. Stuart. This is an interesting time for me. I shared this with Jerry yesterday on a on a, on another call. Um, after months of trying to run down what was going on with me and my health, I just got a diagnosis of multiple myeloma, which is a, a 
treatable and manageable form of um, blood cancer. And I just started chemo. So for me, success, and it really is interesting when you're facing mortality and facing some level of severe physical pain. Um, bone pain is one of the, one of the symptoms. Um, and there are many people who live uh, for a long time with this disease. So please don't, um, don't write me off. Don't write me off. You'll have me to kick around for, for, for quite some time. Um, but today I happen to feel really shitty uh, because I just started chemo on Tuesday and I think I overdid it in terms of, you know, physical activity. I was feeling so uh, enervated and, and, you know, and the throne, thrownness is to try and get back to um, the life that you live in, in, in some ways. Um, so right now, you know, getting out of bed, getting meds into me and, and, and um, getting myself to the point where I can move around, you know, somewhat pain-free um, is, uh, is very, it's, it's a success. Um, and so it's interesting how circumstances create uh, different um, definitions of success for you as an individual. Um, so, you know, looking at where we are as a culture and a society today, and thinking back on my own progression through life, um, you know, what, what is success? How is it defined? You know, what were the values that I grew up with in the 50s? Um, you know, go out, you know, um, find somebody to marry, um, make some money, uh, be a success in the eyes of, you know, uh, ordinary social norms, whatever they happen to be for you. Um, and so it's it's interesting to look back by by about age 35, I had I had achieved all those things that 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 traditional culture um had said to me and and ever since then it's been a wonderful um journey and quest um and i was just listening to a a, a short talk uh, by my friend and colleague meg wheatley this morning about perseverance um distinguishing perseverance from um the the well-worn phrase of um resilience um, and I've looked back at, at, at my life and no matter, and I, and I did this on a progression of some kind one time, no matter um, what was going on up and down in my own personal life, there was a level of perseverance about um, what I thought were important goals, um, whether they be writing goals, whether they be um, contributing to the social um, mix, um, whether they be helping um, certain organizations. And um, somehow I think I've persevered. Um, and, and, um, and here I am continuing to persevere. And so there's a way in which, you know, um, the equivalence of, of perseverance and success for me, you know, they're kind of like, you know, hand in glove. You just keep going by what you think is important. And I think that that's a critical um, stance for our time. Um, you know, we're all aware of the multiple um, wicked problems that we face as a culture, as a species, and the idea of getting up every day and continuing to do, quote, your work, whatever you have discovered it to be. Um, that's at, when, you, when you put your head down on the pillow at night, that I think is a, um, a a wonderful measure of success. At least um, it is for me. Um, contributing to places where good work is going on, contributing to relationships that you're in, um, taking care of yourself and others, um, and um, are the people you love um, at the end of the day are they laying their heads down? In, in a place that um, that you as a steward of relationships um, uh, are taking care. Thank you. Thank you for the prompt, um, Stacy, and for, for reminding us of that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you.
<laughs> I like that. You're a steward. How about we put a D at the end? You're a steward of relationship. That's actually very funny, Stacey, because, it, you know, fairly often, you know, someone will address me as steward and, and I chuckle every time that happens. <laughs> we need a new language, right? We need a new language. Finding our way to one. <laughs> Love that. Um, thanks, Stuart. Doug, whenever you'd like. You can't hear, Scott? You're muted. Oh, I thought I thought Doug was saying something. Uh, Doug, might be saying, saying, Doug, you are muted, and you just turned off your camera instead of your mute. There we go. Wait, no, Doug B. Isn't Doug B next in the queue? Uh, he is. And that's uh sorry, uh, Doug Doug Who's Carmichael, on first? I was I was <laughs> talking about Doug B because he had what? his hand up. My apologies. Yeah, I, I um just Stuart appreciate your share and Stacy if you appreciate your prompt. And um and that's actually um and sort of where Stuart headed and left off is where I pick up, which is um, what's been living for me is appreciation uh, as a, both as a noun and as a verb, as a steady state experiential, emotional embodied reality. And finding that, being in that place, as a as a orientation, as a center of gravity, and as a dynamic for me and for um, all the other people I come in contact with and engage with, and all the other things I'm working on and collaborations I'm touching, um, to to find. Um, a, a place and way of experiencing and relating from appreciation and to have in the doing of that an appreciation of value experientially for everybody involved. So it's not just uh, good for me, but it's uh, good for everybody. And um, and experiencing and having that um, feels like success, smells like success, <laughs> um, and, and has a little bit of a joy tra ch chaser, um, even in contexts that are challenging, even in contexts that um, uh, you know revolve around. Um, tough times or, or frictions or speed bumps or whatever. So with that, I'm complete. Thank you, Doug. You're reminding me of April came home once from yoga and the and yoga very often, whoever's teaching will sort of have a little kind of a sermon or a, just a, a sangha or a talk through. And uh, this one was about small victories. Uh, tiny wins just to celebrate um, small successes. And then I just realized that Annie Lamott has a book titled Small Victories, Spotting Improbable Moments of Grace. Annie Lamott? Yeah, I put it in the chat. Thank you. Um, Gil Van Klaus. My my mo <clears throat> my moments of silence are always a little bit longer after Doug B. So I appreciate I appreciate all the things that people are posting here. Um, and what's what's <clears throat> excuse me what's resonating for me? I think someone said it earlier on is that except for the things that are quantitative, deterministic, specific, measurable, um, success is always contextual. And it's always an assessment. It's always a subjective determination by somebody. 
in relation to what they care about. Um, and that's, you know, that's there in some of the quotes that we're seeing here. Um, um, it, you know, strikes me again as an example of where it's, <clears throat> it's dangerous to try to muddle the domains, the domain of the specific and measurable, the domain of the subjective and contextual. They're, they're different. Um, and we get into a mess if we try to see them the same. And so the richness of this conversation is in the very personal um, dimension of it for everybody who's speaking. So thank you. Yeah, I think success is sort of an elusive feeling. Um, you know, you can you can feel um, like you've done. Uh, you feel successful in a metaphysical way or in in a practical way, and then one day and the next day, you know, something happens, and so it's very contextual. You know, as uh, Gil is just saying. Um, and then it's oftentimes really removed from your physical um, well-being, whether that's personal health or whether that's you know, uh, your, your ability to um, sustain yourself, um, have you know, what you need to, to be comfortable. I, I think one measure of success that, uh, that I've, where I feel I can actually anchor it down you now uh, are my two kids and we have um, just really a great relationship and I think that's really precious uh, to to have uh, children who actually care about you and and your well-being and who want to be uh, uh, in contact and talk and connect and so that's that I think is is a highlight of uh, of uh, what I would consider we have been able to succeed with, but every everything else <laughs> is um, is elusive. You know? it's uh, uh, and and you know, as, as we already said, the more you chase it, the more uh, the, uh, the more it wants to get away from you. So so yeah, so I would say um, um, the one the one thing that I would claim as success is our relationship with our kids and, and to see them thrive and, and be successful. Thank you. Uh, Gil, I think you still have your hand up and Scott had a brief comment in reply I, to you. Yeah, it's it's a, a question of, to, to Klaus, just very quickly. Um, wonderful story about your children and your relationship now. Was that an intended success or was that something that you discovered later on and then can find those threads of how it happened actually it, it really starts to become sort of a manifestation since we retired and it's actually probably fairly recent um because we had ups and downs and and uh um, we have now settled into we want to be friends, you know. We want, and it's actually when you think about your own life, the importance of of your relationship with your dad, your relationship with your mom, right? The, how important that is. So now, uh, in my mind, I understand my son uh, and the need you know, to to have a dad that is proud of you and. Uh, uh, appreciates you and support and 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 boosts you up, right? Um, and and you can unload your your, uh, your your concerns and your worries. You become, I mean, my wife is the counselor, you know, to both our kids, and so that is uh, that is a relationship that that formed actually uh, later. You know, and our kids are both in their thirties, so yeah. So no, this didn't just happen. Thank you. Uh, Hank, uh, Stacy has a quick comment to follow on. Do you mind if she steps in uh, for a moment? Go ahead, Stacy. No. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, words, Klaus. When you were talking, it really touched me because where I do feel there was a great success for a relationship was with my dad at the end. We had a very, like a six-week interesting story that I'll tell one day, but 
I remember like the things that I remember on that thread from where I am now to where he went were very successful. And I remember the doctor coming into the room because I would sit with him when he was in intensive care, even when he was in a coma. And he told me, he said, I wish I had a daughter like you. And I know my dad felt that and he let me know it. And the greatest thing he ever, the greatest thing he ever said to me that stays with me from like my middle point to now is always, he, I remember him once saying to me, he said, Larry, Larry was my ex-husband. He said, Larry must be so happy to have you because we, he had started a new business and I was helping him and I found like a lot of loopholes and, and quick fixes. And I said, no, dad. I said, I said, he's not. It's like, it's like he's in competition. Like he, and I wanted to share that because I think one of the leverage points, one of the places that can be shift. And I think why I've been drawn to come here has to do with what I'll call the M line. And that's misogyny. And I just want to be able to show both sides. On the other side, I do not have a very good relationship with my children right now. The, it's open, the heart, you know, it's open. They're all at different levels. So there are three different stories. And then Mar I had a great one with Marley though. Me and Marley had the, had the best. So Marley was my teacher. And at the end of his life, I definitely served him, but he served me his whole life. Thank you for letting me go first. Um, thanks, Stacey. And Hank, I don't know if you stepped out of queue intentionally or unintentionally, but the floor is yours if you'd like it. Well, I stepped out intentionally because I was going to have a completely different kind of uh, segue, and I'd rather well, I'm complete. Hear some, I'd rather hear some silence after what you said, Stacy, than than talk about something like Good I was idea. going to bring in. I'll I'll come in later. So why don't we just take silence and wait for you? Let's. Why don't we take a minute, and then what, if Ken doesn't mind, I'd rather take a minute of silence. Let Hank finish this thread and then go to Ken and start a new one. Thanks, Stacey. Thanks for sharing. Thank you. Um, aside from uh, the topical uh, stuff with computers, taxes, and uh, picking uh, printers that I talked about earlier on the call, I'm also in a somewhat emotional uh, stage of uh, this year. And just before this call, uh, I was on a call with a close friend uh, from my early youth, who I've been out of contact for many years, and he saw contact. And uh, he's got stage four melanoma, and uh, we're, we're being very positive about uh, the process of reviewing life uh, while you're still around to do it. So uh, I would like to say as a follow-up to what Stacy said, uh, success is remembering the things that you once forgot and can be brought can be brought back into your consciousness by unexpected contacts with the past. And uh, other than that, I put a couple of things which were rather personal into the chat about what success is. And uh, they, they resonate with a number of things other people have said. Uh, success is figuring out how things work as you go along. Success is continuing to learn even when people say you're too old to learn. And success is doing the things you like and liking the things you do. And uh, one of the things I like to do is come to these OGM calls. And uh, we had a conversation last week, I remember, uh, sparked, I, if I remember correctly, by comments by Doug and, uh, and also Scott 
about how a year and a half ago or two years ago, there were a lot more people who came regularly. And uh, now it seems to be down to about 10 or 12. And I've been thinking about that uh, all week since, since that conversation took place. And in the, the way that Jerry rephrased the uh, question about success for OGM or for yourself, I was uh, well, I wanted to make a, a contribution about the success of OGM and these OGM corns. I'm not here every week, but I feel I missed something if I miss a call. And I do my level best to organize the rest of my life, personal and professional, around being able to be present for the call. And whether it's 25 people or, or 10 people or the, let's see, the 14 who are on the call now, for me, it's an uplifting experience. It's an always unexpected experience and looking for a, 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 another word to express it. I keep thinking of it as a learning experience. And I like to express the idea that this OGM call, maybe others as well, I, I take part in a number of other good OGM calls, but this OGM call is, uh, for me, the uh, archetype of an, of an online, uh, of a digital learning experience. It's creating what the Japanese call a BA, B -A. it's a, a shared context for co-creating new knowledge. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I think it's often hard to do it in physical co-presence, and it's even harder to do it sometimes in uh, digital co-presence. And I think we succeed very well. Uh, and there's a core group that's here today and maybe a couple of other people who haven't been here for a while, but show up regularly. And I just would like to express the fact that uh, having these calls as we do and having the participation that we do and the mutual respect that we do is for me a really good measure of success. So I think of success, not in terms of the great peaks of, oh, wow, look at what I've achieved, but in terms of the great valleys I've come through that have had me wanting to give up and being able to put one foot in front of the other, no matter how bad things are. And sometimes they've been really bad in my life and I didn't give up and I'm still here. As Steve McQueen said in Papillon, I'm still here, you bastards, you know, because um, without that, I wouldn't be able to enjoy the success, you know, and uh I just think that it's it's very easy to get seduced by the positive side of success and forget all the stuff, all the suffering we've each of us have had to go through. And I'm sure every single person on this call is their own share of, of very tough times that we've been through, but we didn't give up. We kept on showing up, kept on taking a breath, kept on putting one foot in front of the other and dragging our sorry carcasses along until we could get into a place where we might experience a different level of success. And I think that's a really important thing to um, just bear in mind as we look at what success is. Thank you. I have to say, Scott, I don't think of them as failures. I just think of them as things that, that didn't work the way I wanted them to. Because failure has such a heavy emotional baggage to it. It gets attached to shame and stuff. And sure. There's no shame of what I've it. gone through. Yeah, things that didn't work the way you wanted them to, I think is a, exactly. is a better way of saying that for sure. Jesse, I think you know the protocol, but just in case the floor is yours whenever you want to step in and thanks for the pause. Great, thanks, Jerry. Really appreciate all the shares going on. Um, really making me ponder. 
Uh, I'm not video friendly today. <laughs> mm -hmm. Success to me is a smile, uh, which of, of course includes laughter. And it's really an interesting thing as I'm sitting here thinking about how it's encompassing uh, an outcome and input in it and a measure. So um, as, regarding an outcome for myself, um, the smile is um, for myself and then all, for others, like my partner and my children and my family. Um, and it really, sometimes it comes from deep listening, like everyone is sharing. Um, sometimes the smile is a measure, a kind of like a smile index in a way. Um, and sometimes it's an input and it could change someone's day, you know, just a smile. And a Buddhist monk I heard, I love this. <laughs> he says something like, when you smile, you're actually giving someone a flower. And when you, when you're, uh, you can smile with your eyes, you're actually giving them three flowers. Oh, I love that. Yeah, I love it too. And, and you can smile for yourself too. Um, myself, I, I would just put a fake smile on it sometimes just out of like, look in the mirror and smile. And, and, and I find myself, um, learning how to smile in meditation now, um, which, you know, when I breathe in, I feel the pain either mentally or physically. And when I breathe out, I feel the mother smile in me. So, outcome, measure, and input. Thanks. Very nice, Jesse. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, outcome, measure, and input. Uh, I'm hearing that as breathing in and breathing out. And breathing in and breathing out. Uh, and the, the smile is a wonderful thing to call up. Uh, everybody just, you know, smile for a moment. Uh, and feel what happens to your body and your being, you know, I mean, e even if the smile is, 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 uh, you know, directed and not spontaneous, it ripples. Um, so, uh, good, good practice. I'm, I, I'm, I'm remembering as, you know, listening to people and Ken and Scott talking about things, you know, success is things that didn't work out the way that you wanted to. I remember that wonderful story that, you know, I think it shows up in Sufi and Zed and Hasidic and other traditions about the old farmer and the horse. And folks probably know it, so I'm not going to retell it, but, you know, something happens, it's terrible. People say, he says, well, maybe. And then something good happens to recover that. They say, that's great. He says, well, maybe, you know, we'll see. Uh, and uh, he has, in this story, has a kind of equanimity in the rise and fall of events that other people are characterizing as success. Uh, and so be, maybe moments of equanimity are a kind of what we're calling success in this conversation. I can see the floor is yours whenever you want to step in. I'm wondering if he hears us. Doug, <laughs> can you hear us, Doug? Uh, that's me, Doug. Yeah, yeah. you. Doug B just, uh, I, just I missed part call. of it, but here's what, here's what I want to say. Please that uh, I love the history of words and success is no surprise. It means moving out from under, which into free, a space of larger freedom. I think that's quite beautiful. Beautiful. That is lovely. 
Thank you. Um, this is smaller scale and success. And Stuart, I'll, I'll step in for just a sec. This is smaller, smaller scale than success. But a long ago, I heard somebody talk about the grace factor, and I adopted it. And the grace factor, pick a small percentage, 3%, 2%, 5%, something small. And then think that whenever you're undertaking any kind of activity, you're, you're, you're driving someplace, um, you're going to get a flat tire, you're going to run out of gas, something, something's going to happen. It doesn't happen often. But then when that thing happens that normally would be like, ah, God damn it, you can be like, oh, I just, I just got rid of some of the grace factor in my life. And, and let, you can sort of set some of that percentage of size, like, okay, ka-ching, that, that solved that. Um, and that connects to a bigger issue, um, thing that I, that I also adopted, which is how you handle inputs is just immensely, enormously important. When, when bad news shows up, when events happen, if, if you can sort of keep your head and just find the equanimity in some way, regardless of what's going on, really often the thing that happened isn't nearly as bad as you thought it was. Uh, your response is, is better and therefore converts the situation, whatever it might be. But, but when we're triggered is when an involuntary response emerges from us because of something, because of history, because of uh, out, outlook, because of uh, anything it might be. And then we're not sort of in control very much. Like being triggered is, I think, an involuntary thing, usually. That's that's how, how I, at least I think of triggering. And um, handling incoming things with grace, the other use of the word grace maybe, um, is I think a, an important human trait, a thing I really admire and, and um, an important and lovely thing. Uh, off to you whenever you'd like, Stuart. Yeah, so um, two things I want to mention. One, um, just to punctuate what Gil said, about breathing, <laughs> you know, the whole notion of uh, inspiration, <laughs> inspiration, and just the magnificence of recognizing and stopping for a moment, the miraculous fact that, <laughs> that we are alive, that we have these, you know, bodies that ambulate, that we have these minds that can think, that we have these vehicles that carry our soul through life as long as we're living. Um, and I just find it, I, you know, lately I've developed this practice of laying down in bed at night and actually just breathing for a while and feeling myself um, breathe and feeling the joy of, um, of being alive. <clears throat> just it, It's just extraordinary um, to recognize um how we as human beings um you know have these qualities that so many external phenomenon uh, are modeled after um you know computational power of our brain and mind uh, just extraordinary ability to ambulate um extraordinary ability to appreciate to taste smell touch um feel um is just magical in certain ways you know that 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 food grows from the earth um that babies are born um that um erotic pleasure is available i mean it's just it's just magical when you really start thinking about it and we have moved so far away from that in the concrete worlds um and the built worlds that we have um, created, um, thinking that that's what life is. <laughs> and it's not, and that relates to success in terms of, you know, early drivers. <laughs> Thank you, Eric. Early, early, early drivers. Um, probably of most of our successes here. Um, and, and the other thing that I wanted to say is um, a reminder of the 
the Hopi prophecy um, from 2000, the idea that great, massive, powerful currents will be coming and that the people who try to cling and hold on to the shore slash the way it is um, will be torn apart by the power of the currents and, and that um, getting out into the current, letting go and being able to swim, walk one foot in front of another, one stroke in front of another um, is kind of the key to survival in some ways that 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 piece of perseverance that we've we've um many of us have touched upon every time you said perseverance stuart i for some reason i've heard the british pronunciation in my head perseverance <laughs> And I don't, I don't know where that came from. Yeah. That was, I, I was doing a lot of work in the late 90s in um, English speaking countries all over the world. And one of the things that I noticed without any consciousness at all, that after about a week in country, you are you just pick up the pronunciations and you listen to yourself and you just kind of chuckle a little bit. <laughs> you come back to the US saying aluminium. <laughs> The redundancy of it all. <laughs> Has everybody had a chart? I think every, uh, John uh, John Kelly, you're listening in. I don't know if you can <clears throat> if you can step in, but you are welcome to. Yes, <laughs> I am listening in. I am parked <clears throat> outside my uh, client where I'll have to go in pretty soon. Uh, I really have appreciated this, uh, you know, once again, this uh, OGM group, um, the image is coming to me as stumbles through profundity, but it does, you know, it's just, there's stumbling definitely going on, but there's also a profundity uh, at every turn as, as people discover, reveal, expand upon um, their experience. I had a kind of a, 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 an imperfect analogy, but it's, it's, it's kind of fun to play with these things, even if they're uh, off a little bit, you know, and I was thinking about a diet and I was thinking about a diet over a lifetime. So, you know, when we're babies, we need the food to be, you know, very easy to digest. It has to be crunched up, you know, and, there's certain things that we should not have as babies uh, that they would just overwhelm our system, you know, and then we pass into a, uh, our young years and we can eat just about anything. And we try to demonstrate that, you know, we try to down as many uh, burgers and fries and other strange things as we can. And uh, then we get through life and then we kind of realize, you know what, um, that's not a good, that's not going to work. <laughs> you know, I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to, you know, reduce some things definitely. And I'm going to have to be, and then by the way, I appreciate certain things that I didn't appreciate earlier, you know, like salads and uh, you know, and I'm, I'm not as, not as fond of dessert, you know, it's, it's a lovely thing to have, but you know, less. And, and again, you know, and then you move into your senior years and you say, you know, yeah, I really do need to be careful here about uh, what I'm putting away. Of course I need, I need to eat the people who stop eating, you know, they, they're not going to be here very long. Uh, but I need to eat carefully. I need to be judicious about what I'm putting into my body. So just apply that curve to the idea of success. So when you're young, you know, well, well put it another way. It's not, it's not so much age. It's uh, life experience. If you have been deprived of success, then you'd like to get it in the pre-digested form. You, you'd kind of like the, the baby mix, you know, uh, a birthday will do fine. Or, you know, I mean, a friend calling you up, any, anything will work, you know, if, if you've been deprived. And then when you get kind of used to it, then you kind of start taking it in stride, start taking it for granted. You say, oh yeah, yeah, you know, we'll achieve this goal, we'll achieve that goal. Yeah, cool, you know, that's kind of the adolescent success. 
And then, of course, you move into the adulthood and the maturity and you realize, you know, this is a good thing. This is a little like sugar, you know, it's great. It's essential, but you, you got to be careful. You got to you got to kind of recognize that it's a indicator of something that's larger than what it actually manifests or it how it actually manifests in the way in which we're getting it. So that, you know, ultimately. Where the, the image, the, the final image I got of success was um, that you. You are you belong to the context you're in. And you see how by being in that context, you also belong to the bigger picture. So that's one one version of success. And I now need to go take care of somebody who has Parkinson's. Mm -hmm. And he reminds me, you know, how lucky I am. So have a good day, folks. Um, thank you. Thank you for that. Stacey, thank you for looking around. Can I suggest that we take a, a breath and then I saw that, um, you know, we, then we could like this would be the second, third, and you could run that whole thing. And I'll just let you know that Doug C, I think, had something he wanted to say when we come back, but I'm not sure. And then I'll, I'm going to be quiet now as part of the S protocol, because that's like what I'd like to do. So you're asking that we take a moment of silence? Yeah. Sure. Uh, why don't I, let's, let's go quiet for a little bit. I'll bring us back out. Thank you. Michael, you have arrived in the middle of a moment of silence, which I will now complete, and then I'll bring us back out. Thank you for the gift of the sun in your sky. Yeah, I figured I would leave it up there, even though I was going to be off camera. Beautiful. Come out of the silence. This moment is feeling a tiny bit like Quaker meeting, which is a lovely thing. And for those of you who've never attended Quaker, the way Quakers worship, uh, it's uh, basically an hour's quiet meditation with other members of the meeting, during which nobody is paid to give a sermon. Uh, in a couple of types of Quakerism, they might read some scripture before or after, not in the ones I attended, but at any moment during the meeting, somebody might stand up and have a message for the meeting. And there's a whole, there's a whole kind of thinking about what's, what's called vocal ministry, because a, a principle of Quakerism is that uh, if we don't minister to each other, nobody will. And I love, love, love the way that puts the responsibility for ministry on everybody in the meeting. That that's one of the, the little jujitsu moves of Quakerism that I really admire. Uh, it, it, you don't outsource <clears throat> thinking about spirituality to somebody who's paid for the job. You actually do it together or you don't get it done at all. And that, that shift of responsibility and, and presence is really wonderful. Um, and it, and your, your normal, typical Quaker meeting might have five or six different people stand up and say something. It's not typical to converse through the messages. You don't respond to other messages. You just let them be individually. And if you have 10 messages in a meeting that's known colloquially as a popcorn meeting. Ten, 10 messages are sort of too many, which is which is interesting. And the, a message could be a minute. It could, it could be a short, somebody might recount a story of something that happened to them and what it made them think. It might be three minutes, whatever, but they're not long. They're not very long. So I was having a little moment of that with you all, which is lovely because the Quaker meeting for me has always just been uh, in physical spaces and Quaker meeting houses. And Quakers also avoid all 
uh, religious. So they don't have a congregation, they have a meeting, uh, they don't have a church, they have a meeting house, et cetera, et cetera. They avoid, and, and to some point they, they spoke plain speak. Um, I'll just refund this for just a second more. Uh, th there was a while, it's not traditional anymore, where they talked about first day, second day, third day, first month, second month, third month, because the names of the days and the, the names of the months are all about uh, ancient gods and goddesses and, and whatever else. And they were trying to sort of be uh, removed from all of that. Um, and then they also, uh, in history, and probably still in some communities, referred to each other as thee and thou which some people see as maybe pompous speech, but it came directly from the idea that God is in everyone. And if I sort of raised the way I address you, um, that would work, that would be great. Um, and Ken, you were waving, does that mean you've got to go? No, it's me who has to go. <laughs> oh, sorry, Stuart. sorry but, Stuart. But I, just, I just wanted to say, Jerry, when you uh, talked about me and thou, you know, it reminded me of, um, Martin Booper's I Thou, mm -hmm. which is to me shorthand all about creating subjective and real relationships in people, you know. Um, so thank you. Thanks, everybody. And Stuart, um, I didn't know how I didn't know how broadly you were going to share your news. I really appreciate you talking about it here. <coughs> um, yeah. Gil, thank you. Um, we'll be in touch offline as needed, okay? Um, um as, as as you want, I'll let you take lead. Thank you. Blessings so much. Um, Eric, you're next whenever you feel like stepping in. Hello, everybody. So this is a great topic. Um, I mentioned Randy Pausch, uh, and he wrote uh, a book and did a video called The Last Lecture when he knew he was dying thinking about how do I tell my kids? How do I tell my students? He was at Brown University. And I recently learned about some of the work he did because I've been looking into the intermedia system. And as I do my vintage computer projects, I learn things and I'm fascinated by what they were able to do at Brown in the 1990s with a Macintosh else, uh, whatever it was they used, CI2 or something, a server. And uh, so there's videos on the internet for anyone who wants to see all that. But um, yeah, I'm constantly learning and it seems that learning is what I enjoy, um, not necessarily jumping into new projects or, I mean, I could think about ideas and play with them, but uh, I guess my perspectives have changed like, ever since I, my, I'm now in my 50s. So now <laughs> I guess perspectives change around that time. <laughs> um, yeah, so I've been through some difficult few months at work and with a big implementation, global stuff that I've never imagined I'd be working on and uh, dealing with changes to that. But yeah, but where is my real life purpose? It's not at work. <laughs> okay, so, and I'm seeing other opportunities to connect with people and share music and, uh, I did something this weekend, which was fun. Uh, at um, I'll post a video of it in the chat. It was a vintage computer event uh, where I played some music. I posted it in the music meta for anyone who wants to see it there. Okay, so um, yeah, so um, the Jewish holiday of Shavuos is approaching, and that's a time for study. And uh, the Book of Ruth is a topic of study, which you can get some interesting uh, insights from that. Um, and uh, it's related to Pentecost uh, or in the Book of Acts. So to the universal time of, you know, well, what laws do we follow as human beings for morality and ethics? Just that kind of thought for it's for anybody who wants to think that way. So just here, um, growing with all of you. Thank you. Eric, what's the date for Shavuos this year? 
I think it's Friday night, uh, but I'm, I'm doing something thir t tonight uh, with a friend. So you could just check online. Uh, usually Chabad has the official dates. It, do, it does start Friday night. Uh, yeah. And tr traditionally, there's an all night study, like you know, went, sundown to dawn study process this year because it uh, <clears throat> falls on, on the beginning of the Sabbath. This is going to be a Friday afternoon study. Uh, in Berkeley, it's quite remarkable. All the Jewish denominations from ultra orthodox to crazy wild hippie all come together for the study process with each of, you know, each, folks from each tradition teaching. It's a, it's a very unusual and delicious blending of traditions that don't usually have a lot to do with each other. It's quite lovely. That sounds remarkable. Eric, thank you. And Doug C, just to make sure you have the floor whenever you want to start talking, but I don't know if you're like just giving us a pause or not, but it's yours to to do. No, I'm, I'm here. Okay, good. Uh, I've been uh, having a difficult time seeing when I'm supposed to talk because the uh, Zoom frame is cut off by the top of the laptop, uh, iPad. That explains So I don't things. see the hands. Excellent. <laughs> so I'm um, glad I, I'm glad I told you to say so go ahead. Good. What is, what's on my mind is we tend to think of success as going along with big projects and big things. But in fact, we're surrounded by successes all the time. And I believe we feel them. Uh, the cat comes in the room and I look to my left. That was my intent. And I succeeded and I feel it. Uh, it's like we're... I have this image of being in a fish tank surrounded by goldfish, each of which is a success of some motion that we undertook uh, to do. Uh, so anyway, that's my thought is just success is, is everywhere. I remember once thinking that every, po and this is not me, just me, every posture is a yoga posture. So you do everything that you do, moving your head, biting your lip, uh, we do it well or not, uh, but generally we succeed and can feel it. End of thought. Thank you, Doug. Um, your, Doug B. brought us toward appreciation a lot, and I think appreciation and gratitude are successes as well. They're appreciations of the small things you just pointed us to. I don't know if I should go, which which way I should go. You want to hear the goldfish story or the Shavua story? Man, uh, hands up if you want to hear the goldfish story. <laughs> goldfish? I think the Shavua's. I think it's Shavua's. So probably around 2014, when I was like right in the middle, it was right, be 2015 is when I decided to get a divorce. 2014, I was still serving on the board of a temple. And um, I woke up. And I went to see, I went to Chabad services over in Westchester, and I didn't know what it was, but I wanted to try it. So I got I remember I got from I think it was three o'clock in the morning. I had to be there, and um, there were all men there. They were so wonderful to me, and I got to that particular man and his son that was there. I don't I think they had two little boys that were there too, maybe, but. When he spoke, I listened, I thought about it. I reflected some things that, well, maybe it was this. They were so, it was just a beautiful experience. And I just wanted to share that. Speaking about that particular group, not every single Chabad group around the world, that particular one, the members that were there at that time in that moment were really loving. Maybe that's why I showed up at that one. I don't know, but I wanted to share that. <laughs> thanks, Stacy. And just before uh, Scott steps in, uh, Michael and Carl, thanks for joining. We're our topic today is what does success look like for you? 
Uh, and th that could be success personally, it could be success for OGM, it could be success for anything. So we've had a lovely conversation so far, and you are welcome to step in uh, whenever you'd like. And Scott, the floor is yours. Um, so riffing off of Doug um, about noticing successes, you know, turn my head and I succeeded in turning my head and looking at the cat, which was my intent. Okay, so success. What I've been noticing in the last couple of years is how that's embedded in language, the creative power of language, and how you can you can get this in a million different ways. You can have thoughts become things, or you can have every word is a spell, or you can have the fact that every magic user in any Dungeons and Dragons game has to speak to be able to cast the spell and make something happen. And if you prevent them from speaking, they they can't do the spell. And it's just, it's so deeply embedded. You know, you know that the creation story is that, you know, the spoken word brought things into being. You know, it, we don't even realize how deeply embedded that is. And it's, connected to this idea of success that I think Doug was talking about, which is making something happen that didn't, that making something exist that didn't exist before, making something happen that didn't, you know, there's an intent or, and, and you say something and then suddenly you have a peanut butter sandwich because you said, Hey, I'd like a peanut butter sandwich. You've actually verbalized it and then it became real and it didn't exist before you you said it. And I think that that's a really important um, part of agency that we've lost or that we've we've forgotten about sometimes is that your word, well, and I'll, I'll wrap this up with the last several months of large language models and chat GPT and all of that, where I haven't heard anyone talking about the idea that your words are your words and there there's a divinity in that and there's a there's a there's a uniqueness and there's a quality about that that's yes I can use it to summarize for me yes I can use it to create words for me but you're missing the point the point is that your words are your power, are your creative power, are your perspective. And I've specifically written a little section in my book that I'm writing that says, I will not use any of those models to create this because I want this to be my words. Not for any other reason, right, wrong, or otherwise. But so I think that's an important part of the angle of success that I believe Doug was uh, referring to. I just want to thank Scott for that share. That was so profound and insightful and worthy of going back and just looking at it from all angles. Something I will definitely write about. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Scott. Dr. Grossman. Hello there. Um, I was thinking about, I, I hadn't known exactly what you were talking about, you know, what the, the theme of the meeting was. Um, and thinking about um, what success means and almost stopping and tripping there before I got the to the, to me, to us. And, um, and for understandable reasons, the word successor um, popped into my head. Um, and I, I went, went grabbing for, you know, origins and etymology of, of the word success and, um, and somebody succeeding somebody else or groups of people succeeding other groups of people. And um 
it, you know, I was thinking at first that success to me means um, sustenance and, you know, being able to, um, I mean, I long ago, you know, gave up the idea that I was going to hit the jackpot. Um, uh, and um, the, the idea of doing something that um, is, that brings success to the rest of the world and uh, manages to sustain me and which produces a successor condition um, that <laughs> succeeds me, <laughs> um, that is that is good and successful for everyone. So it's a little uh, existential there, but um, that's what success is meaning to me today. Love that. Thank yeah, thank you. Scott, I think you still have your hand up from earlier, unless you want to jump back in. Thanks. So I, I recently came across this uh, guy, I think his name is Robert Henrik. He's a professor of evolutionary biology at Harvard. And he wrote a book, uh, he's written a couple of books. Um, one of them is on how weird people, you know, came about Western industrialized, uh, educated, rich, democratic. Very fascinating interview with him. Um, and I was looking at his personal website and he said, one of my guiding questions is, how did humans go from being an unremarkable uh, primate, you know, in the recent history to becoming the most successful species on the globe? And that really made me wonder what his, his definition of success is because, while we may have been uh, successful in solving a lot of problems, we've also been incredibly successful as like creating a lot of problems to the level we're about to um, self-inflict extinction on us. So maybe there's a larger conversation about, besides what does individual success look like to us? What does success as a species look like? And as far as I can tell, that goes back to Bucky Fuller's designing the human presence on earth to be beneficial for all, all beings, because at the current rate we're going, we're not going to be around for very much longer. So just to put a different frame on success there, you know, um, how do we as individual actors who often feel that we don't have a whole lot of agency because systems are so large and remote, how can we find the leverage points to um, uh, make those changes? And, and Doug Carmichael is, you know, um, constantly putting out every day, you know, we need to talk about climate change, we need to talk about garden roll, we need to talk about strategies of how we're gonna, how we're going to be successful. So we've got been successful at this point, but our success is not assured unless we take a moment uh, or, or a decade or a, a century to really reevaluate what human success looks like on this planet. Just thought I'd throw that in there. Thanks, Ken. You um, you took me to a really interesting set of thoughts, and also in combination with Scott about language, and that is um, the manipulations of our measures of success, which are really obvious. Uh, you know, the ownership society is a George W. Bush meme that was all about getting everybody to go own a house, buy a house, and drive you know drive traffic that way. Uh, the American dream predates that, and the American dream is. Uh, rugged individualism, everybody owns a house with a cocker spaniel and a station wagon and a white picket fence and a whole bunch of other things that come along with uh, the American dream. A piece of it sort of became everybody goes to college, which is not an assumption in other parts of the world. And it's not because they don't have enough colleges, it's because they have other reasonable paths to success in a livelihood or finding your way to your calling or whatever else it might be. Um, so, and I, and uh, you've heard, some of you have heard me talk before about how I think that we're in a titanic battle over the narratives in our heads and that that is my version, my amateur theory of history, that, that history is the story of competing factions fighting over the narratives of kind of success and failure. Uh, I'll point out also that religions seem to use the afterlife 
as a form of success and goal orientation. Like you want to behave well because otherwise you won't end up in paradise, you'll end up in purgatory or whatever else that might be. Um, so these are all constructs. These are all uh, built up things. And there's a bunch of groups at some point I was sort of collecting them up in my brain, of course, uh, uh, groups called Rethinking the American Dream or some variant thereof. Because the American dream as sold and bought by Americans was toxic, was was not helping us. A, a piece of the American dream seems to be that there's limitless resources because we have this wide, expansive country where you can go forever and that nobody else existed here before Europeans showed up. And now I'm verging into sort of white nationalist versions of, of the American dream. Uh, but uh, but language is essential and, and, and how we reframe or address what we think about as our goals uh, matters enormously. Yeah. Hi, this is Jesse. Um, just talking about language and I was on a call with someone in the in the OGM group the other day and she and I were going back and forth and I just realized like three times in the conversation did I say um, wow that word actually means this to me and after the third time I go oh I realize I'm actually sounding like I'm maybe making you wrong by just saying what it means to me but I want you to know my intention is um, to know how I lived that word out and how I perceive it. And it allowed for us to have deeper listening for each other. Um, she's like, no, no, don't worry about it. This is actually really good. Um, but there is two different ways of receiving um, the, the response of saying, this is how I see it. And I mean, she received it just fine. Um, but to, have, to hold that that space um, in a safe way. Two people were willing to do that, and and we did, and it was beautiful. But uh, the word was, I think, one of the three was the use of better or best, hmm. and that actually infers not good enough. And we use it a lot. And um, I have lots of words that I almost wanted to create a dictionary of the power of words, but I just came across one actually in the library the other day, and. Um, in Barnes and Noble, um, there is the power of language in it. And it actually did do what I wanted to do. So I was like, yes, someone figured it out. <laughs> they published what I was wanting to do. Love when I see that. You might write the optionary. Mm. <laughs> um, and I love what you're describing about clarifying what things mean to us. I think that's one of the paths toward sorting things out and bridging the cultural divide and what have you is just going back and explaining what we mean. Uh, one of the virtues of nonviolent communication, a really great process with a terrible name, is that the process involves uh, the two parties, the two often aggrieved parties, paraphrasing what the other one says without agreeing to them. So, so Ken would say what, what, what he felt, and it's my role, it's my job then to repeat back to Ken, in other words, what he said, to the point where he thinks I understood what he said, but I'm not agreeing with, with his premises, because obviously he's agreed with me. But the mere act of putting in your head and coming back with what you think the other person said and getting that corrected softens everybody up and find, often finds a nice path into the middle. So I think it's an admirable process. Go ahead, Scott. What I've found over the years is that I love those settings that Jesse had described where you're, you're with someone who's actually engaged with you in a conversation and a dialogue of understanding and curiosity and empathy and really wanting to not be right, to, but to, to understand. And a lot of times I find when I raise questions like that, or I, I say a distinction about something, and then I ask, what's what's your distinction on this? What's your definition? The response tells me that they hadn't really thought about it. And that's that's troublesome. 
and it's it's it feels like an attack because I'm saying, well, you without saying these words that you haven't really thought about that, have you? And so what you were you what you were saying was that this equals that, but you hadn't really thought about what either one of those things mean to you. And so it's I love those conversations when they happen, but but it's I can see why they don't a lot because people haven't done even the next level of thinking to say, what do I really mean by better? And I just use the word better. Okay, but what, what do I really mean? And not a lot of people want to think about what they actually mean with those all-powerful words, those magic spells that they're casting every day with their with their language. Thanks, Scott. Scott, I've been loving your riffs this morning on language and magic. Um, and it's a it's a territory I've been hanging out in a lot. I've been, I'm, I'm running this experiment on myself. <clears throat> so when somebody says something, um, I, I habitually am listening for, what do I know about that? What does that mean to me? Do I agree or disagree? Are you right? Are you wrong? Uh, you know, there, that, that's sort of already there in my list. I'm saying I, but I think this is very general for a lot of us. This, you know, I, I'm, I'm listening into a context that I'm already carrying. And I'm forming judgments of like, yes, that's right. No, that's wrong. Yes, I agree. No, I don't. You're an asshole. You're a friend. Um, and the practice is, is a more open and receptive listening. And not making the immediate judgment, but responding with something like curiosity. Oh, that's interesting. Why would you say that? Or why did you say that? Or what brings you to say that? Or I can see why you may say that. Let's talk more about that. And use it as, as, a, as an opportunity, not for a judgment, but for an invitation into a conversation and relationship. And it's not easy because the, 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 the steward used the word thrownness before. The, the thrownness that we come into it, what we are thrown into, the way we just sort of show up in conversations is so deep and so habitual. Um, but the experiment's really interesting. And feels like it opens up possibilities of, uh, I don't know what, possibilities of something that feels important to, to you know, find you, you've, possibilities of connection rather than division. Scott, sorry. I'm going to accept that experiment and challenge. And I have a way I'm going to do it that's very short and succinct. Because okay. you, I think you're right. I think I come to those situations preloaded. My guns not, not are you, all of us. All right, of us. Exactly. Not right. all of us. Not all of us. <laughs> well, I bet you do too, Great. Stacey. But Some, all okay. is the next way. All is yeah. the next way. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Stacey. <laughs> so what I'm going to try to do, Gil, in, in honor of what you're you're doing here, is I'm going to use my favorite. That's interesting. Tell me more. Mm -hmm. But I'm going to use it every time. I'm not going to try to think Ooh. about what I should be asking or how should I frame this question or anything? I'm going to use the same phrase every time because I know that it's not cool. it's not me. It's it's a it's a welcoming of what you're saying is interesting. Tell me more. I'm and that shuts me up from saying anything that that I have preloaded. So I'm going to try that as my like default instead. Cool. Let us know. Um, Mr. Homer, I have a small suspicion you might have been thinking about poems that relate to success. <laughs> I don't know. We've had a couple suggestions in the chat during the call, including one by Emily Dickinson and one that Stuart had written. But if you were to just suddenly arise with such a thing, I think it would be a lovely way to wrap this call. I think I have one and, in there too, Jerry. Oh, yeah, cool. who's the author on that, Stacey? I don't remember. <laughs> I sent it another call. It's in. It should be in your files from a, from Gil has it. I think from a long time ago. Cool, Gil, you'll pull that right up. I'm sure. Um, I'll pull it up from the now. chat. But it's not from my files. Scrolling well, I pulled back, it up on the chat. Back, there's no author back. listed. Uh, oh. there's no author listed. But uh, is your it. hand still up? Or are you done, Gil? I'm done. Sorry. No worries. No worries. So, I I, I, I was listening into this call and, and there is a poem i think I've, I've shared it before but i'll share it again it's called the goose by muriel spark mm. 
you want to know why I'm alive today? I will tell you, early on during the food shortage, some of us were miraculous, miraculously presented, each with a goose that laid a golden egg. Myself, I killed the cat green thing and ate it. Alas, many of the other recipients died of gold dust poisoning. Hmm. Want to hear that again? Mm-hmm. Yes, please. I'm putting that in. You want to know why I'm alive today? I will tell you. Early on during the food shortage, some of us were miraculously presented. It's with a goose that laid a golden egg. Myself, I killed the cat going thing and I ate it. Alas, many of the other recipients died of gold dust poisoning. Mm-hmm. Little different view on success. I got to go. Great to see you all. Have a wonderful week. Thanks, Ken. And you thanks, know, the, uh, in, yep. in, the story of the, in the story of the golden calf in the Bible, uh, not only did the Israelites build this golden idol and dance around it instead of dealing with the uh, reality, but uh, as punishment or as maybe as treatment, uh, Moses ground the thing into powder and put the powder into water and made them all drink it. Can you say that one more time? It went too fast for me. Sure. Um, put the powder into um, water. Moses ground up the golden calf into powder and put the powder into water and made the rebels drink it. Thank you. Thank so you. Speaking of gold dust poisoning. Thank you. Was it or meant treatment. kind of as a purgative, maybe? I don't know. Just kidding. No, 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 no. I got about I got about three thousand years of commentary that you could read about just that question. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> or sit quietly. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thank you, thank, everybody. Thank you all for a delightful call. Really appreciate your being here, Stacy. Thank you for reminding me about the the topic that we turned over last call. And uh, well, I have something to say. Please. If anybody wants to come on Monday to the Marley call, there's a homework assignment. That would be to listen to Jerry's brain drops that he just put out. Um, the one about, you said something like, does your, does your BS meter go off? Something like that. If you could put that in the chat, I'm gonna open up the Marley call with that. If that's, yeah, yeah that's what I'm um, doing. <laughs> so I'm not sure I have a brain drop about, uh, so uh, when somebody says, trust me, right? Okay, but can you put the one that I need that I need for my Marley call, and then you could do your own thing. But that one I need. If you or I don't have to use it, I could just paraphrase yeah, yeah. it when I start. Well, I think so. Brain drops are what I'm calling very my YouTube shorts uh, and so forth. I don't know that I have a brain drop done about this. Is my question? Whatever you just put up, because I that's what I just listened to. I don't know. I didn't pay attention to what you were calling it. Ah, uh, okay. Just have notes on it somewhere. <laughs> Um, so what I put in the chat, um, I don't see anything in the chat. Yeah, I don't oh. either. I, so you mean what I mentioned? No, um, I mean the recording you made. I saw, I saw a recording. It, it was a little short that you made yep. and it said, um, you guys you... figure it out and let us know. All right. Well, if uh, you well, want thank... to get it thank and you. watch, bye. We'll sort it out. Thanks everybody. <laughs> Goodbye.